Hello everyone, it's Sam Herbert here. Um, I'm going to talk to you about colour and painting. So this is um, the second lesson that we are going to be discussing colour and the theme for today is um, the influence of colour. Um, this is called A Colour Has Many Faces, which is a quote from Josef Albers, the famous Bauhaus teacher and painter, abstract painter. Um, this is about the influence of colour and the title alludes to the fact that colour is incredibly relative, more so than any of the other components in 2D um, visuality, that the colour is influenced so heavily by other colours that it's um, in relationship to that the same colour can appear to be radically different depending on what its company is. So to understand what that means in practice um, is the first big step you can take to being efficient with colour and making sure that your use of colour has um, what we alluded to in our first lesson, visual power. So to begin with, let's talk about Johannes Itten's 12 hue colour wheel. So again, uh, to recap, I touched on this last week, but Itten um, was one of the influential teachers at the Bauhaus, like Albert's. Um, not identical, his, his idea of colour theory is different to Albert's, and um, there are different schools of thought on whose is better. But Itten is known to all students of art, at least in the West, because of his 12 hue colour wheel. Everyone will have seen this colour wheel. And I spoke a little bit last week, we were looking at um, the difference between colour theory and colour practice, where we were looking at the practice of mixing and how Itten's colour wheel sometimes isn't the best guide for mixing. Well, today um, you're going to have to for the purposes of this lecture, you're going to have to put that to one side because we're going to look at the theory of it first and then it will be applied into practice into actually making painting. So I uh, hope that makes sense. So let, let's just refresh our memory what the colour wheel actually is. So the first part of the colour wheel is this, the three primary colours, yellow, red and blue or as I've written it there, red, yellow and blue. Then there are three secondary colours. So we're now up running up to six colours. Um, the secondary colours, they're the admixture of the three primaries. So yellow and blue is green, uh, red and yellow is orange, and red and blue is violet. And then finally, we connect these with the tertiary colours, excuse me, to arrange these with the tertiary colours, and that gives us the famous colour wheel. Um, the tertiary colours are yellow orange, red orange, red violet, blue violet, blue green and yellow green. That's the 12 step colour wheel. Now, of course, it's arbitrary, the 12 steps. The 12 steps were decided on by Itten because they seemed the most efficient. They seemed the, the most clear cut to us. There's no reason why you couldn't have a 100 step colour wheel um, with the colours um, gradually changing as you move through. Um, Itten chose this model because it was the clearest, it was the simplest to understand, and in effect it does its job. Most colours can be pegged to one of the, the 12 hues that are on here. So now we've established that, let's move on. That's the colour wheel without the writing on it as well, just so you can see it. It's from um, Itten's famous book, uh, The Elements of Colour, a very, very influential book on art education and colour. Um, let's talk about the primary colours. So again, there is a question mark. I've put a slide here uh, showing you, reminding you that there's a difference between additive and subtractive uh, colour. Um, subtract, subtractive colour is um, the use of pigments. So, and we established last week that the best pigments for um, mixing um, uh, subtractive colour aren't red, um, yellow and green, they are magenta, cyan and yellow. Interestingly, when you use light, um, just to confuse matters, uh, green 
is actually um, the optimum color and not yellow when, when you use light to more properly to get light. And that is provable when you think of RGB displays, red, green, and blue. That's why they use it because they're the most efficient ones to go together to merge to make um, white. So it's slightly confusing that we are left with uh, red, yellow, and blue. Um, Itten explains that a little bit in the elements of color. We, we just need to live with that, that red, yellow, and blue um, in artist purposes, not mixing, but just in terms of fundamental primary colors. They're the ones that have been established as the primary colors. But I just thought I'd put that there because some of you may be confused because you do see that uh, red, green, and blue coming up. So red, green, uh, red, green, red, yellow, and blue are the fundamental primary colors. Um, by fundamental primary colors, I, I mean that they are the absolute blocks of where color comes from. Um, the thing that's really important to take on about the three primary colors is that they are completely different to one another. There is nothing of a yellow in a blue and there's nothing of red in a yellow and there's nothing of red in a blue either. They, they are completely things on their own. Um, they attract one another because they're in what's known as a complementary triad. What that means is, is that putting the three together, they kind of work together. We spoke about complementary colors being the, the two opposites. Because they are three opposites, there is something about them being together. Um, they complement one another because of their differences. Um, there is no relationship between each of those colors. The only way that they can be related um, is through brightness and saturation. The hues, which is the, the type of color, are, are completely different. Um, more on the primary colors. So the thing to think about here, again, is about that relationship that the three of them have to each other, that they, 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 they complete one another, that they, they seem to want one another, that when they, when they are together, they offer something to a painting that is able to successfully balance the three primary colours. Uh, they exclude one another because they're not in it, but they are also attracted to one another. That's what we mean by complementary. Um, if a composition works with the three primaries, and this is the key thing, you get the balance of them right, and the balance can depend on what your composition is, what's going on in the painting. There's so many variables there that there's no hard and fast rule on that. You, you have to start developing your own sensibility about where they balance. But when you do get the balance between red, blue, and yellow, um, the, the when it's successful, um, it feels decisive, it feels like it needs to be there. It feels like it's always been there. It, it confers a real sense of stability and classicism. Um, that, that is, if you look at a lot of classicist painting from art history, you'll notice they make great play of how these three colors interact with one another and how they lock together uh, and they create that sense of stability. Uh, Poussin is a, is a good artist to look at in that respect. So they are the primaries, then there are the secondary colors and they are the connectors. So they will create, as we've, we've established that there is nothing similar between the three primaries. So the connections between them are called secondary colors. They're the colors that lie in between them, they're bridges. Um, so orange is the bridge between yellow and green. Green performs the same service of blue and yellow and purple does the same for red and blue. Um, they are hybrids. Their character is the fact that they are a mixture. They do carry something of the other color. That's where they're different to a primary color. They, 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 they've got a marker of the other one. Um, if they are dead center, they should be poised between the two like a bridge, but they can sort of veer towards one or the other. Um, there is a duality that, that they, they, they vibrate, they want to be attracted to one side or the other. And again, for an artist, um, this gives you opportunities to create dynamism, that, that when you have violet, orange or green, they are far less decided. 
they are far more um there's a feeling of transience that's starting to come into the painting they don't feel as stable and and it should be pointed out that that's not a bad thing you know that that these are all effects that an artist can use so you shouldn't really think of stability classicist stability of the three primaries as being the goal um there's so many examples where you might want creatively to put a disruption in and, and that's where thinking about use of the secondary colors can become very very powerful when you can use that in relationship to the the primaries as well but the secondaries the thing to say about them they are defined by their relationship to the primary colors because they sit between them they are the bridge other things about the secondaries, so they are trans, they, they are the transitions. They're not the pole. The 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 the, the poles of the color are the 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 primaries. The secondaries aren't the poles. Um, they are the points at which other things move from. Um, so a good example is this watercolor by Cezanne. That if you look at a lot of Cezanne's uh, late watercolors, they're extraordinary. Um, that they, they, they don't use pure hues or, or when they do, it's very significant where Cezanne will put pure hue in. Um, they are always feeling like they're moving or in flux. Um, there's no rest anywhere. But the genius of Cezanne is that he's able to balance those in an incredibly compelling way. Um, and this is a fantastic example. If you look at this uh, watercolor uh, of Mont Saint-Victoire, uh, you know, green, orange, and violet in there. And, and just the balance of that is a fantastic example of how you can use the, the, the three secondary colors to create a really strong feeling um, of, of movement, of transience, of flux, um, extremely powerful. Other things you can think about is, is if you are making a composition and the primary elements, uh, the, the primary colors rather, are subordinate elements. So, so that means that you might have a red and a blue. I mean, you shouldn't, we don't work in threes. It, it, you know, you need a variety of colors sometimes in it. And it could well be that you do have blue or red or yellow in there, but they are subordinate. That is, they are not the defining color. Uh, they can become the subordinate color and the secondaries take over. Um, the, the key thing is, is that they are still there. That the, the point about that is if you've used the secondaries, uh, the secondary colors, an orange, a green, and a violet, as um, the primary um, elements of your painting, they're always defined by their relationship to the primary color. And this example, very famous example by Matisse, um, there are two examples of the primaries here um, where they're recognizably primary. That's the blue of the sky, and there are little blue flecks, much stronger blue flecks in the bouquet. Um, other than that, everything else is sitting um, in between. The, 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 the red of the ground is looks like there's, there's, a, there's an element of blue and yellow mixed into it. There's purple in the mountains. And particularly the, the dominating color here um, is the fact that there's this washed out yellow that seems to be going through everything. It looks like um, Matisse has mixed it with a lot of the other colors that the, the, the green of the sea looks like is mixed yellow in it, that there's yellow in the, the sand as well, there's yellow in the figures. So we are, even though it's not really present, its absence defines the painting. And, and, and that's how Matisse has been playing around um, with the color and the use of balance there, a, a very, very sophisticated use of color in this example. And the final thing to say is um, this regarding primary colors again, that you may be working with the primary colors, but to exclude one of the primary colors, let's say that you are working with two of the primaries, but one of them is missing. Um, there is a one-sidedness to its mood. 
when, when that's gone. The, the, a great example to look at is the late work of Rembrandt. And you'll notice that there's almost a complete absence of blue in those paintings, that they, they sit in these orange, red, yellow. Um, and those paintings have a very, very powerful temperament, that, that there is something really powerful about what Rembrandt gets across there by using such a limited palette. Um, the question mark would be that if blue was involved in that, because blue will suddenly lock everything in and, and the, the, they're asking for the blue, the, the, the yellow and the red feel like they, they need the blue. By removing that blue, you're creating an absence and that has given Rembrandt, it's, it's, it's extenuated the, the emotional power of this painting in Rembrandt. There's so many other examples that you can look at um, that you should do some research, but something you could think about, uh, other very, very famous examples, um, I would suggest look at uh, Van Gogh's Sunflowers. Um, I think Van Gogh, in a way, that the way he uses colour is really important, that if you take this theory and apply it to Van Gogh, you'll, you'll see lots of examples of this. And also, um, very, very um, obviously, is Picasso's blue period and his rose period, where, where, where everything is inflected by one of the primary colours, um, and they have an extremely powerful sense of mood. So, so it's... It's not something to be avoided. All, none of these things are prohibitions. You, you shouldn't say there are things you shouldn't do, you should do. It's simply about sensitizing yourself to the possibilities and understanding that, that they all have um, a creative output and they can make your work stronger and more visually powerful and more worthwhile looking at. So that's what we're going to be dealing with in the practical work. Um, I hope this has helped. Do some extra research on it. And um, as with everything, you'll find out more by actually getting stuck in and um, making it as a painting. So thank you very much for listening and um, I'll see you in the lesson. Goodbye.